On behalf of the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Denver's Joseph Corbell School of International Studies, I'd like to officially open this conference by extending a warm welcome to everyone, particularly to our out-of-town guests, many of who've traveled far and wide to be with us today. This conference is officially titled, What Went Wrong? Examining Egypt's Failed Democratic Transition. And it's the second conference that our Center for Middle East Studies is hosting since we were established approximately two years ago. I'm often asked by my colleagues and friends, what is it like to teach and work at the University of Denver? And I inevitably say that it's both a joy and an honor to work here, in part because this university is very well governed and has an excellent administration. The faculty, the staff, and our research centers receive generous support and encouragement from the university administration, from the chancellor, to the provost, and from our various deans, all of who take academic freedom very seriously and who encourage academic excellence. I'm honored to have with us today the dean of the Joseph Corbell School, Ambassador Christopher Hill, who's taken time out of his busy schedule to be with us. Um, he's been a very strong supporter of our center from day one, and he's done really an excellent job in uh, leading the uh, Joseph Corbell School, increasing its prestige and raising its profile to new heights. Um, if you want to find more about Christopher Hill, I don't think he would mind if I mention that he's, his new memoir has just been published by Scheinman and Schuster Books, and he will be on a book promotion tour fairly, uh, fairly soon. And uh, Chris, thanks for coming today, and I'll turn the floor over to you to make some introductory remarks. Thank you very much, Nader. And let me congratulate you and uh, Danny for uh, putting, all this, uh, putting all this together, uh, and, and Doug as well. I think um, there is, there's never a bad time to be talking about Egypt. Uh, but this is, I think, an especially good time and especially important time to talk about Egypt. When you look at the, um, at the crises in the Middle East, um, perhaps none is as more difficult as the one the region is facing today. Um, we know the uh, uh, efforts by President Obama to kind of re-engage, get the United States uh, re-engaged in the Middle East. For many people, that is a, uh, uh, something there. Uh, some people welcome and some people don't. And in the past, in the past when there have been these kind of um, region-wide issues, Egypt has been a very important participant in, um, in all of them. Egyptian diplomats have always been uh, very active, frankly very successful, working with other uh, countries in the region, calming some down, uh, encouraging others to be more active. And yet Egypt is um, kind of uh, missing in action in recent uh, recent years, and that is because of this continued, uh, uh, so far, unsuccessful transition. I think whether the Arab Spring goes down in uh, history as a success or a failure, to some extent, will depend on the outcome of, um, of what has happened in, in Egypt. And so while this um, conference has an air of, say, of kind of looking at the past, i.e., uh, what went wrong and how we're going to examine what went wrong. Obviously, um, we also ought to have an eye to the future of how it can be put right and how the issues can be addressed. Because um, I think as many people have said before, as Egypt goes, so goes the region. And so uh, we need a, um, a successful uh, transition in, in Egypt, uh, an Egypt that is really, that fulfills its uh, its uh, responsibilities and, its asp and the aspirations for its uh, population. So I think there is no better time than to uh, have this con uh, conversation, have this conference. We have some of the most distinguished scholars on the, on the subject. And uh, this is a real credit to this uh, nascent Middle East Center that we've uh, uh, had here at the University of Denver. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention John de Blasio, who is uh, a person who has um, given us a lot of funding to get this thing going. Very pleased with uh, what we did last year with uh, Syria. And then the various impromptu things that we do just last year, just last, uh, seems like last year, three days ago, uh, we just had the ISIS crisis uh, conference. So 
I look forward to uh, many more of these conferences, and always with the idea of being prepared to discuss all kinds of different uh, viewpoints, uh, never afraid to uh, say things that others might uh, disagree with. We uh, really take seriously uh, the you in university, meaning to be universal in the, uh, in the opinions we, uh, we seek and, and seek to uh, examine and critique. So um, thank you very much for all coming. This uh, so far is not one of our 320 days of sunshine, but uh, my understanding is it's going to be uh, sunny and uh, 78 degrees tomorrow. So um, it'll work out for those of you who uh, can stay through the day. Thank you very much. OK, thanks, Chris. Um, Although Egypt has receded from uh, the headlines, the questions that we will be exploring today transcend the news cycle and are geared toward a much longer and deeper understanding of contemporary Middle East politics. The questions this conference will explore are also deeply connected uh, to the mission of our Center for Middle East Studies, namely to examine and explore the relationship between Islam, um, Muslim societies, and the question of democracy. The themes of the first two of our panels directly overlap with the mission of our center. Um, the role of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt's democratic transition and Islamism, liberalism, and democratic theory lessons from Egypt's uh, failed transition. Just a brief word now as to why Egypt matters, why we're doing this conference. Egypt is the intellectual and cultural heart of the Arab Islamic world. Um, as the famous saying goes, when Egypt shakes, the rest of the region feels its tremors. What has unfolded in Egypt over the last three and a half years encapsulates some of the key tensions and debates in contemporary Middle East politics, the persistence of authoritarianism, the legacy of the post-colonial Arab state, the relationship between religion and politics, the role of religious-based parties and actors in politics, the uh, tension and divide between the religious and the secular. As one of our speakers, Joshua Stacker, has noted in one of his writings, post-Mubarak Egypt is a story about the potential and limitations of popular mobilization, revolutionary and counter-revolutionary dynamics, and an epic struggle for power between an entrenched military, Islamists, and revolutionaries. But even more so, it's also a story about an escalation and expansion of state violence against the rest of society. End quote. And these are some of the themes we are going to be touching upon and exploring um, during this conference. Now, just a brief word about the format of the conference. Our conference invitees know this, but just so the rest of the audience is on the same page. Um, we chose to organize a conference not based on uh, paper presentations, but really on a roundtable sort of format conversation. Um, and expanding the conversation beyond the assigned initial participants to the rest of the conference invitees, and then, with time permitting, um, taking questions and inviting the audience to participate as well. I guess the first thing I should mention is to ask everyone to uh, silence or turn off your uh, cell phones or anything that might make a noise um, that might disrupt um, our discussions and our deliberations. As the conference program mentions, our first topic, um, the first panel here, is the role of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt's democratic transition. Um, um, the initial uh, uh, participants in this conversation are Imad Shaheen uh, from Georgetown University, Mona El Gabashi, independent scholar, Joshua Stacker from Kent State University, and Shadi Hamid from the Brookings Institution. I'm not going to give them a long introduction. You have their uh, bios in the conference program. It'll simply detract from the time that we have to examine this topic. Um, some of the, you know, the themes and the more precise questions that we want to explore um, over the next 90 minutes are really an examination of the role of the Muslim Brotherhood, in particular President um, Mohamed Morsi's time in office, uh, the strategy that the Muslim Brotherhood was pursuing, to what extent they bear unique responsibility for the shaping and the unfolding of events that has uh, taken place in Egypt over the last three and a half years. In retrospect, one of the good questions to ask is perhaps to look back and ask what could have they done differently that perhaps could have shaped a different outcome. And then with time permitting, as the dean mentioned, we perhaps should have a conversation about the future. What is the future role um, of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt? What internal debates are taking place within the Muslim Brotherhood based on recent events? Um, to get us started, um, 
um, I want to draw everyone's attention to a very provocative and at the same time insightful piece that uh, Shadi Hamid wrote uh, not too long ago in, in The Atlantic called, uh, Was Muhammad Morsi Really an Autocrat? Um, I think that uh, paper, that article, bears directly on this panel. And um, Shadi sort of argues in that piece um, he has a line that I think encapsulates the argument. Uh, Mor uh, Muhammad Morsi was no Mandela, but he was no autocrat either. I'm going to ask Shadi to sort of give us an overview for the next 10 minutes, and then we will get reactions from um, our uh, invited panelists, and then broaden the conversation to the rest of the panel, and then to everyone in the room. So Shadi, the floor is yours for the next 10 minutes. Great. <coughs> uh, thanks so much, Nader. And uh, great to be here back at the University of Denver at the Corbell School. I was just here, I guess, in April. So, um, <clears throat> okay. So, I so I co the the author the the article that um, Nader mentioned, I co-authored with a uh, with a former colleague of mine, uh, Meredith Wheeler, who's now a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, and we kind of came up with this <clears throat> idea because it, it was bothering me for a long time that we kept on having this discourse. In, in Washington, but also elsewhere, that there was something distinctly undemocratic about Mohammed Morsi, and that this was often used to justify and legitimate what came after. And what came after, of course, was the coup of July 3rd, 2013. So when the article came out, some people said, well, Shadi, this is, you know, this is a little bit academic. You know, why are you going into this quantitative study of how democratic or undemocratic Morsi was? But I think it does matter in a very real way. Um, if, in fact, the coup and supporters of the coup um, use a particular argument to justify their support for the military and then support for mass killings of the Brotherhood and this very kind of repressive approach, if, if they're using Morsi's undemocraticness and the various bad things he did to justify their positions, then it really does matter. And not just from an Egyptian perspective, but also from a US policy perspective that many US officials, not just um, certainly privately, and in my own conversations with US officials over the past two years, this has come up a lot that Morsi was undemocratic, quote unquote, but also senior officials such as John Kerry have made this argument rather explicitly in public. Um, and then also using a similar discourse of the Muslim Brotherhood hijacked and stole the Egyptian revolution. So kind of intimating that there was something that the Brotherhood took what was at first a democratic revolutionary movement for, for freedom and turned it into something else. So, I felt that for us to be able to have a more, a more um, you know, reasoned discussion about it, we actually had to look at this more comparatively, more historically, and also in a more quantitative fashion, because we all have our biases. The Muslim Brotherhood tend to think that Morsi was the, um, the, the great Democrat of our era, and the other side considers him to be you know, the next um, a Hitler or a Mussolini in in the making, and actually that was that was one of that Morsi is is a, a a Mussolini figure was some that became quite common in Egypt. So everyone has their biases. So how do we kind of avoid that? So what we wanted to do, and at first it was just kind of a thought exercise that we thought would be interesting, but then we actually did it. Is that we thought we would score Morsi's one year in power according to the Polity Four Index, which is the most which is the most widely used social science data set on levels of democracy. And it's also quite good for this purpose because it tracks year-to-year -year changes. So it's responsive to this kind of shorter-term look at, um, which is important in, in, in the case of Egypt where things were changing quite rapidly. So we, we scored Morsi's one year in power. And I, um, I won't get too much into the data and the details. They're in the article. And we'll be building on this initial article in the future as well and going into more detail. But essentially, we scored Morsi as a 2. So negative 10 is the most autocratic um, a country can be. And 10 is the most democratic. So Morsi ends up being, the Morsi era ten, uh, ends up being 
a democratic leaning anocracy in the in the language that polity uses. I won't get into all that stuff, but essentially what it means is, um, uh, you know, he was somewhere in between. Now, we took a, a, a random stratified sample of 32 other countries and we scored them uh, because some of them weren't actually scored by polity before. And then as an additional check, we compared Morsi's one year in power to three categories that Polity 4 had already scored. Those categories are positive regime change, minor democratic transition, and major democratic transition. And with that, we had 400 additional country years with which to compare Morsi's one year in power. Now, what we end up, just very briefly, before I'll just talk about the, the implications and why this matters and what this means for us from an analytical perspective, um, the mean value of positive regime change and democratic transitions over the period of time we were looking at were t was 2.18. And the average value for societal transitions, the, that other polity category, was negative 0.97. So compared to other societal transitions, which is a particular category which means that um, which kind of indicates a more volatile moment where it's not just a political transition but also a social transition where where countries are very deeply polarized over issues such as the role of religion in public life. So Morsi then scores significantly higher than the mean value for societal transition. So Morsi gets a two compared to negative 0.97, which is the mean value. And he ends up being pretty much um, at the same level as other examples of democratic transition and positive regime change. As I said, that's 2.18, and Morsi got a 2. OK, that's the numbers. If you're interested, I can talk about that more later. And it's also in the article. So essentially what this says is, and I, let me just say as a, as a kind of disclaimer, right now, Morsi failed to govern inclusively. He was the he was the wrong man at the wrong time. And as someone who who got to know Morsi personally, and interviewed him several times before he became president and spent time with him, this was not the person you wanted to be Egypt's first democratically elected president. And none of us as Western research, researchers really cared that much about Morsi because he never really had anything that interesting to say. He was a kind of loyal brotherhood apparatchik. That said. Um, he was, um, he's really the only Muslim Brotherhood leader I can think of who would do impromptu impressions of former U.S. presidents. So I will note that. He does a good Jimmy Carter impression. <laughs> that said, um, so anyway, so Morsi was, Morsi was incompetent, ineffective. He failed to govern inclusively. The messaging was disastrous. Didn't have a plan for handling the economy. They were, they were simply unprepared. But that's different than saying that he was a dictator in the making or that he was unusually autocratic for a transitional period. And we argue and um, that that's simply not accurate if we look at the numbers, if we look at it historically. And we conclude in the article that he was no more autocratic than a typical transitional leader, and he was more democratic than other leaders during societal transitions. Now, um, so people can bring, and I think one of the key things here that we, were, that we were very cognizant of was what we call the right to recourse. So even Morsi did suppress dissent in a number of ways and harassed and threatened certain prominent opposition leaders. All of that is certainly too true, but there was no real attempt to systematically prevent the opposition from engaging in the, in the political arena. So you could, there was still freedom, full freedom to organize political parties, to contest elections, to protest. And if there was anything that the opposition was doing pretty much every day in the lead up to the coup, it was protesting. And not just protesting, but many were also calling, sometimes quite openly, for a military coup. And some, in some countries, openly calling for the overthrow of a constitutional order or explicitly for a military coup might actually reach the bounds of, of protected speech. But even that was allowed under Morsi. So 
the opposition, as bad as Morsi was, and as, as afraid of his rule and the Brotherhood's rule as they were, they still had the right to recourse through a legitimate political process. Parliamentary elections were coming up. Um, there was also an impeachment mechanism, which was probably, um, the bar was probably put too high, and that's something to think about in terms of constitution drafting, but there were still legal and legitimate means to oppose and constrain executive power. Now, with a couple minutes, I have uh, just last two minutes here. Um, one of the criticisms that I got after we published this article was, um, and some Egyptians were very, um, including friends of mine, were very angry at me, um, although they've been angry at me for a while, but putting that aside for a second, um, they said, well, Shadi, this is not how we lived it. We were living there, and you're trying to reduce our very complex experience to a quantitative study using a political science data set that we've never heard of. So, and that that is a valid point, but that was precisely what we were trying to do. We were trying to move away from the lived experience because the lived experience is what you experienced. It's not, it's, a, it's obviously by definition ahistorical, it's not comparative, it's an individual experience. And it's your individual experience against someone else's. And who are, who are we to say which interpretation of a very complex set of events was more legitimate. So what we felt was precisely this, that we have to move away from this kind of anecdotal approach and really talk about where the Egyptian transition fits in in the broader context of how we understand democratic transitions. And that means not measuring Egypt's experience against the hopes of revolutionaries, because it doesn't usually work out the way revolutionaries want it to. That's one. And also, we shouldn't measure the Muslim Brotherhood's year in power, even SCAF's year, in, year and a half in power, against the ideal of liberal democracy. It's very ahistorical to think that you can get to liberal democracy in two or three years. Historically, that is not the way transitions work. And you know, even in our, our own experience, we can look at how challenging and how much push and pull there was before we got to what can be considered liberal democracy in the modern sense. So, and this kind of gets to, I think, you know, a bigger issue that if it wasn't, if the issue, if the real deeper issue wasn't in fact that Morsi was an autocrat, then what was it really? And it would also be odd to argue that a military coup was justified because Morsi was becoming an autocrat when it's very clear now that pro-regime Egyptians have no problem intellectually, philosophically, practically with brutal repression. So, I mean, it doesn't make any sense as an argument for them to say we oppose autocracy when they in fact support it very enthusiastically. So what it's getting to here is that pro-regime Egyptians today oppose autocracy in the service of Islamism or in the service of what I would call illiberal democracy. Because if Morsi, if Morsi and the Brotherhood were at least somewhat democratic or not as autocratic as we maybe thought they were, that, that's a different thing than saying how liberal or illiberal they were. And I would argue that while the groups like the Muslim Brotherhood believe in the democratic process, they are deeply Ill illiberal. And if that, that's an argument that liberals, that liberals can and should make, and that's where it becomes more understandable because the Muslim Brotherhood does in fact have a distinctive vision for society that departs quite considerably, considerably from the liberal democratic model. And I'll just, and, the, and that's where I think the, the utility of having these discussions is really important because we also have to disentangle liberalism from democracy, and I think we'll have a lot of discussion about that. And that's also something I, I, I discuss um, in, in my book, which came out recently, and just as a plug, it's, it's also in the back of the room, where I really try to make that argument that we have to, we can assess level of democraticness, but we can't mistake that for being the same thing as liberal democracy. I think we as Americans have gotten into this habit that when we use the word democracy, we assume that to mean liberal democracy. But if you look at the sequencing in the evolution of Western Europe 
or the US, you see different, different sequencing, that you have the foundations of a constitutional liberal order first, and then and only then do you move on to democracy in the sense of universal suffrage and full political, political equality for all citizens. So I'll just kind of, I'll, I'll leave with that because I think that can also help um, prepare us for the coming discussions. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Shadi. I'm going to turn to the uh, the other members of our panel and ask them to weigh in with approximately, you know, maximum five minutes of introductory remarks on Shadi's argument as to whether um, the uh, claim that Mohamed Morsi was uh, not an autocrat, yes, he was incompetent, but not autocratic in the way he ruled, really stands up to critical scrutiny. And then we'll, you know, take the conversation in other directions, but I think we should examine that particular sort of thesis uh, at the outset and, and then move forward. So I'll turn over to uh, my right, Imad, then Mona, and then Josh, and then we'll move forward. Thank you very much, <clears throat> and thank you for inviting me. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I will tend to agree with um, many of the findings that the Shadi's study have um, demonstrated, particularly if we focus on the essence of the struggle, what was going on in terms of the conflict in Egypt and the democratic transition and so on. But let me just you know, say two kind of uh, footnotes, very quick footnotes, because I feel here that we are starting reading the book from chapter two and not chapter one. And chapter one was uh, the transition itself uh, we can divide it, of course, into maybe two, uh, definitely two phases. The first one, the longest one, uh, a year and a half under the what we call the SCAF, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, the military. And I think to a large extent uh, the um, outcome of the first phase had a lasting impact on the second phase itself in terms of the revolution, in terms of the social and political alignments that took place later on in terms of the uh, reconfiguration of uh, political positions, and of course in terms of the polarization that started, of course, to characterize the second phase. So we need to take note of this, that this is actually a second of a, a multi-track or multi-phased process. The second uh, important observation that I would like to make is, um, and that's speaking about myself, uh, if I make any notes or remarks, what I have in mind, of course, is the concern about the democratic transition as a process. Not, of course, a specific regime or a specific personality. I might be critical, I might be, uh, seem to be supportive of certain uh, uh, phases or whatever, but here the concern is uh, about the Egypt's opportunity or, or, the, or the opportunity that Egypt had to move away from an authoritarian, uh, military, dominated uh, politics and regime into some kind of a, uh, a democratization. Let's call it a democratization process where you have the things that Shadi referred to, the freedom to protest, the uh, manifestation of people power, the uh, elimination of fear from the government, the challenge of authority. These are all things that the uh, January 25th, 2011 revolution at least brought to the uh, political behavior and political psyche of Egyptians. And I think the current regime is trying very hard, very hard actually to reinstill or to reinstate this fear barrier. Uh, so speaking about this, or having said that, we can of course uh, look at the, uh, uh, the process itself uh, through this at least two, three uh, uh, major or general arguments. One, that the Muslim Brotherhood uh, as a, an organization has not been uh, democratic enough and therefore had to be removed. Uh, the second one was, of course, the, their failure to manage the entire transitional process, the democratic transition itself, the second phase of the democratic transition. And the, also we can look at as a possible uh, reason, uh, not necessarily separate because they all can be combined, also the success of the opposition to uh, topple in collaboration, of course, at some point with the old regime to topple uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. So uh, the, the opposition uh, did not behave as a loyal opposition for reasons, of course, that we can discuss. Uh, but having said that, of course, can reflect some kind of you know, ideological, maybe, can reflect some kind of ideological biases. And I would just focus on five, uh, from my perspective, what can be seen as uh, five reasons that 
affected the transition in all its phases. And I think they relate to a large extent uh, to the literature about democratization, because I think this is also an opportunity for us to link the uh, popular uprisings that have taken place in the Arab world uh, to the wider literature, literature of democratic transition that took place you know, elsewhere. And, and we have some kind of a regional comparativism in that respect. One, of course, uh, reason for the, the, the failure was the longevity of the uh, transitional phase itself. And that, I think, was deliberate. You can have, of course, a, a long transitional phase. You can take Tunisia as an example. But Tunisia is uh, progressing in its transitional phase on, while trying to force some kind of consensus or consent over the major uh, guidelines of the transitional process itself. This is something that did not have, uh, happen in Egypt. What, we, what happened in Egypt actually was a, 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 the absence of a roadmap that can achieve the transition and also can uh, secure some kind of consent or consensus on the, from the different political forces. So we have a very long transition that was missing some kind of consensus or agreement on the major, uh, from the major actors. Also in Egypt, we had an issue of the um, early disagreement about the uh, political boundaries of the system. And what, what I mean by the political boundaries of the system here, the conception about the, the issue of identity and how that was translated into simple political decisions that were taken, uh, constitutional articles, role of the Sharia, uh, and how we, 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 we at early on, we transformed these political differences into ex existential issues. Like if someone messes up with Article 2 that relates to the place of the Sharia in the Constitution, that could really constitute some kind of a major uh, disaster with regard to Egypt identity, <clears throat> the secularism, and so on. The second, uh, of course, major issue was the uh, identity of the state, the description of the state that we are trying to build. All this mess about you know the civic state period, which of course for some uh, meant exactly secular state or civic state with an Islamic reference, and all this kind of you know like really useless uh, debate uh, managed in the end to polarize the, the, most of the political uh, 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 actors. A fourth uh, reason, of course, was the, um, uh, the, the quick early uh, division over the process itself, which process we should take. Revolutionary process to continue on with this revolution and all what that entails. And that's, of course, here a major issue where the Muslim Brotherhood can be responsible uh, or a, some kind of a gradualist, reformist uh, uh, process that can uh, prepare for a smooth transition. Um, here, Egypt, of course, political culture, political history uh, was a major factor. And that's what distinguishes Egypt from Tunisia, for example. <coughs> uh, Egypt as a, I, I call it, you know, like really a heavy state with a long-lasting, long-standing bureaucracy, institutions, presidential institutions, uh, political parties, uh, and so on, uh, I think there was a, um, a, a determination to, or, 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 or a determination <clears throat> to, to, to really build permanent institutions first. Like, you know, this is a state that really wanted to go back to some kind of stability. So we needed an institution first, like the constitution, like presidential elections, like parliamentary elections, and so on. However, not realizing that these permanent institutions were actually being built on a very shaky ground of discord and disagreement. Tunisia exactly was the opposite. What they did, they realized the potential disagreement and this, this, content, this discord and so on. So they start building per, uh, temporary institutions until they forge uh, some kind of consensus, and that's why they seem to be uh, more uh, successful than Egypt. And Tunisia, until now, still has a, an interim president, an interim assembly. Uh, the constitution was approved uh, last July, uh, last, Jan uh, uh, last January, and so on. But at least in the end, they managed gradually to build uh, permanent institutions after. Uh, finally, of course, the ideological polarization that really killed the entire process. 
and it became a zero-sum game. Great. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Imad, for those sort of overarching um, sort of themes and comments on on Egypt over the last three and a half years. Before I move on to Mona, I just want to sort of get you to issue a statement here on Shadi's thesis um, as to whether you agree with his, his argument that Mohamed Morsi made a lot of mistakes, he was incompetent, but he wasn't an autocrat in terms of the argument that he was another Mubarak in the making, he was another, you know, dictator, et cetera. Oh, definitely. Uh, of course, definitely. And I will tell you some kind of, you know, really factual anecdote. Uh, he was not only a, uh, a someone you know who wants really to maintain the status quo and so on, but he was really a typical Egyptian, typical Egyptian bureaucrat. Um, Which means what exactly? Exactly. Uh, 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 before the end of their term, before they started to realize that there was some kind of a massive disobedience on the part of the different uh, institutions of the state, Morse's advisor advisors tried to suggest to him to create parallel institutions, mm -hmm. parallel structures. Like, if you would like to, 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 to fix education, forget about the Ministry of Education. Let's build, build a commission right. on educational reform, a commission on health reform, a commission on agriculture, and so on and so forth. He screamed at them immediately, and he said, by doing this, you are dismantling the state, I, and I will never allow you to dismantle the Egyptian state. Mm -hmm. That's Mursi himself that's supposed to come to, actually, or the revolution, to come to dismantle the Egyptian state and actually build a new one. This is a revolutionary process mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Great, thanks. Okay, Mona, um, uh, let's turn to you now. Um, feel free to sort of comment on Shadi's thesis, but also take this opportunity to make you know, an initial broad sort of set of observations on the role of the Muslim Brotherhood specifically in the transition period. What sort of themes jump out at you as being most salient in terms of trying to understand their particular role over the last three and a half years? Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for uh, inviting us to this conference, um, and thank you for the great organizational um, setup. Uh, I, let me start by just giving my gut reaction to Shadi's uh, uh, article. I confess I haven't read it, but uh, I couldn't agree more with it. Um, I don't think that um, uh, Mohamed Morsi was an autocrat. But I think that Shedi's argument, again, not having read your piece, but just from what you said today, doesn't address uh, a prior and more crucial question to me. If indeed, as you found out, and as any uh, uh, sort of more distanced observer of the Egyptian scene would look at it, it's ludicrous to claim that a member of an opposition party that has been out of power for 80 years, just to give some context to those in the audience who might not be familiar with the history of the Muslim Brothers, this was an organization that not only has been uh, subjected to massive state repression starting from the 1960s, but the most that they ever got in the Egyptian political system was a few parliamentary seats. But they were barred from chairing a parliamentary committee. They never were allowed or given the opportunity to run even a municipal council. The most that they were able to do was to run um, student unions and professional associations, what we tend to call subnational organizations. And even their successful running of these subnational organizations was clamped down on by the state because they ran them so well. And the Mubarak regime, it understood that democracy uh, or, or democratic management is built upon experience. So they wanted to cut that experience at the grassroots. So, they, so we're talking about a movement that literally was catapulted into power for the first time from a basis of no experience into the highest and most powerful position in the Egyptian state, that is the presidency. So it would seem to me ludicrous to claim that he was an autocrat. So why then, and this is the question that I want to get into a little bit, why was this claim so compelling, and many, many people actually believed it, both within Egypt and outside of Egypt. And I don't want to dismiss these people, uh, though I disagree with them. I don't want to dismiss their belief, because that belief powered the political actions throughout Morsi's presidency and led to the massive protests on June 30th, in which um, we, won't, we won't ever resolve the numbers. But they were very substantial numbers of people who went out on the streets to demand not just early presidential elections, but many, many people were demanding, and there are photos and, and videos there to prove it, demanding the downfall of an outsider president who had barely been in power for nine to 10 months. So why, then, does this claim have purchase? And I think that the way to understand this is to broaden the scope a little bit and to look at what, what was happening, what happened in Egypt. I know that sounds a little bit silly, but I always think it's um, useful to just look back at events that we think we know 
with a refreshed lens, with a lot of the uh, information that we now have in retrospect. One of the things to remember is that the Egyptian regime under Mubarak and created by Nasser was one of the most powerful authoritarian states in the world, and it was a super presidential regime. The height of or the center of state power was the presidency. It had never been challenged. And in fact, the whole purpose of uh, Egyptian modern Egyptian authoritarianism was to make sure that no rival organization would rise up in these subnational fora to ever take power one day. And then what happens? In, on the eve of the uprising, and I remember this distinctly because I was in a village up in um, northern Egypt witnessing the most rigged elections of Mubarak's presidency, the scene at that time, and I know that many people, everybody on this panel and lots of people on the audience will remember, Egypt looked to be set to a very peaceful authoritarian transfer of power, a very orderly, uh, orderly authoritarian transfer of power from Hosni Mubarak to his son. Right? There, nothing like a revolution was on the horizon. And all of a sudden, in January, as these things often uh, take on a life of their own, a small protest that was scheduled for January 25th turns into a massive popular insurrection that none of us imagined. I mean, none of, I don't think, I certainly didn't imagine it. It was the stuff, stuff of dreams for me. Um, and I, I, for many, many people, this was literally unimaginable. And the reason it was an earthquake, a political earthquake, was because it targeted that central institution in the Egyptian state, which had never before been subject to any kind of challenge. The most that it was subjected to, if you really push me to identify a moment when the Egyptian presidency seemed to be uh, kind of on shaky grounds, was uh, a protest in 1977, the so-called bread riots against Sadat's rule, which he actually, in retrospect, handily uh, dealt with. So this presidency was toppled. What is this heavy state, as uh, Professor Shaheen called it, what are they going to do? Remember, the presidency was toppled, but the rest of the structures of the state, the bureaucracy, and most crucially, the military uh, bureaucracy, was still intact. And they decided, or started from day one, to plan on how to limit the revolutionary potential of having an autocrat who'd been in power for 30 years. Just think about their predicament. They never expected this. They thought that they were just going to continue uh, living with their perks and privileges and never have to deal with the messy world of politics, even the messy world of an orderly trans uh, authoritarian transition. All of a sudden, they were thrust at the forefront of the biggest Arab state, and they found themselves having to steer a very precarious, hazardous, revolutionary situation. So what were they going to do about this predicament? Here's where I want to bring in Shadi's argument. Why did it prove so compelling to brand a weak opposition movement, weak meaning that they never held power under any form, not even for a few days or a week or anything like that in the history, modern history of Egypt? How were they able to so successfully bring along a segment of the Egyptian population and convince them that an outsider political organization and its leader were actually dictators? How do you do that? Right, because it defies logic. One of the things that you do, and this all entrenched political groups do this, is they invoke the rhetoric of dictatorship, and it's particularly the Muslim Brothers proved to be such an excellent target because they were very much a in-group trust network. They had to, to uh, uh, thwart the massive waves of state repression. They had to be kind of an insular organization, highly disciplined, hyper-concerned with maintaining internal uh, uh, cohesion, not very good at outreach, uh, not very good at messaging. Uh, we all know this now. There's no, they themselves sometimes acknowledge that they're not very good. They, they have, almost have a deer in the headlights, which is what happened to Morsi in the last few months and his organization. They kept getting pummeled from all sides by this uh, objectively ridiculous claim of being an autocrat but they couldn't come up with a compelling counter-narrative. Again, they couldn't even bring on board the rest of the Egyptian population who objectively had an interest in change, had an interest in having outsiders get into the state, try to reform the state, and break apart the entrenched fiefdoms of control and interest. They couldn't do that, and they couldn't convince the public that they weren't <laughs> indeed autocrats. And to this day, as Nader pointed out, and um, Shadi as well, very significant uh, segments of world opinion, uh, including John Kerry, if you want to include him, he has bought into this cynically, of course. I, I understand it's cynical, but again, I want to probe why this particular discourse is so, was so successful and continues to be. There are many, many people, perhaps even in this audience, who fear the Muslim Brothers, who find them to be uh, unattractive, to put it politely, 
who find nothing, they didn't see the struggle of Morsi in the presidency, this very precarious outsider president, they didn't see that as their struggle at all. In fact, they uh, 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 cast their lot in with the counter-revolutionary forces or the forces of the status quo or the, uh, whatever you want to call it, these entrenched interests. So um, to, to wrap up, and I'd love to talk more about this, um, and this is going to be a recurring feature of Egypt's political uh, transition or revolutionary situation, as, as many of us believe it to be, where the Muslim brothers are not going to shake off the stigma of being an autocratic uh, uh, organization, nor is any outsider group who ever gets it into their head to challenge this entrenched military bureaucratic caste that has controlled the Egyptian presidency since um, 1954. Uh, thanks, Mona, for those backgrounds of contextual issues that I think help us understand this topic at a deeper level. Let me turn over now to Josh Stacker. Um, you know, Shadi's thesis is on the table here, but feel free to address it, but also use this opportunity to make some introductory remarks about the broader theme of, you know, the role of the Muslim Brotherhood in the, in the, in the transition period. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me, and uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I guess I have a, a couple things, and, and I, I don't really have any organized remarks or anything like this. Uh, I don't necessarily disagree with Shadi. Uh, I think labeling Morsi an autocrat or not, I don't, I don't know how useful of an exercise it is. Uh, because, um, you know, the most autocratic person I know is my 13-month-old. He doesn't care what I say to him, and he wants the world to go around him, and he wants it on his schedule, and he does not believe in consensus. <laughs> it gets worse, right? Yeah, so... So, I mean, that's, what, that's who I think of as an autocratic person. Uh, for the rest of us sort of grown adults out there in the world, I don't know that the label one way or the other uh, means much. I mean, Mubarak um, governed Egypt for 30 years, and he had a fairly inclusive autocratic regime, far more inclusive regime than we probably gave him credit for having. And also, I think that Hosni Mubarak probably did a lot more consensus making with the constituent parts of his regime than was ever he was ever given credit for. Uh, and so to me, the personalities involved in like, you know, is he an autocrat or not, they don't really help me because it's the really governing structures of the transition that really um, determine the behavior of the people who were launched into these positions. Uh, and I think that in that respect, if we're going to go around and assign blame, uh, the Egyptian military by far is the chief reason why uh, Egypt looks the way that it does, why the transition was so botched. Um, and in that respect, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood were really secondary actors who really did not have the agency that the military did to drive the uh, transition. And in so that respect, Focusing on the Muslim Brotherhood is, is a bit of a sideshow. Uh, if you really want to un understand why the Egyptian transition went the way it did, you go look at those generals. And, and it's important. Um, I mentioned that Mubarak's regime was fairly inclusive. When the uprising happened in January of 2011, it caught the regime off guard. It caught the world off guard. It caught the Muslim Brother off guard, who did not initially agree to participate in those um, uprising. And what you saw is you, 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 you saw this dismantling of the state's ruling coalition. So the Mubarak cronies who had been around for 20 years, the ones that hadn't died, they were no longer in the picture. The neoliberal crony capitalists that were connected to Gamal Mubarak, the president's son, were no longer in the prison. Uh, were, well, some of them went to prison and some of them went to exile. They were no longer in the picture. Um, the Minister of Interior was incredibly dis the Ministry of Interior was incredibly disrupted, and there was really no control over it. And I think that the state, even though it wasn't destroyed, and, and I, I think that's why we didn't probably see a, a proper revolution, um, you know, it was disrupted and, and sort of offline. And um, the military came into the situation, and I think they had two objectives. One, they realized that they had been sort of catapulted to the apex of what remained. Uh, and, so they, and they saw that they had some economic privileges and some privil political privileges that they were previously competing for that now they had monopolistic lines on, so they wanted to maintain those privileges. And they also wanted to end the rest of uh, population in the mobilization. And I think that the Muslim Brotherhood, in this sense, was the only real organization that mimicked 
the sort of functions of the Egyptian state, only it was functional at a time when the Egyptian state was not. So the Brotherhood had good links more or less across the country. It could go in when there were sectarian problems. It could go in and, 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 and calm people down, get people out of the streets, which was the number one objective. The uh, military came up with this strategy of electionization, is, is what I call it. So if you were Egyptian between uh, March of 2011 and June of 2012, you could have voted five times in national elections, right? And the idea was they started using elections. And these were pretty free and fair elections. Um, uh, you know. And I, I monitored the presidential ones. And they were, they were about as clean as you get. The context of around them was not so clean. But the process itself was pretty clean. And so, you know, you, you started using, like, the, the idea of actually having free and fair elections to get the revolutionary actors into sort of the state structures to, as a way to kind of calm down that mobilization. And in the process, the, the Brotherhood was on board with this because the Brotherhood made two catastrophic errors. One, they thought, like, okay, they're going to need to do elections to get out of this problem, and we are the group that benefits from elections. So, yes, we will help the military ram down as many elections as they need because the brothers were good at elections. And then the, the second catastrophic mistake that the Brotherhood makes, even though there was plenty of evidence in the initial 17 months, was that... Um, the military maintained its position to kind of be a veto player or to move in or in, and block whatever the Brotherhood was doing. But the Brotherhood continued to play because of the understanding that if the more elections you have, the better this is going to be for us. Uh, and the second catastrophic mistake was after Morsi was elected president uh, with 52% of the population, 52% of the population turning out. Uh, the, the, the catastrophic mistake was thinking that there is absolutely no way that the military could coup them out of power. Like, it was not an option ever on the table. Um, and so uh, Morsi lands into the presidency, uh, and, and he's given a, a series of bad options. He can break towards the state and basically say, OK, we're going to be sort of counter-revolutionary, because the state had started coming back, and it was completely unreformed. right? Um, or you could break towards the street. Now, if you break towards the street, that, that's great, and the revolutionaries are happy. But um, then I think that they would have felt like there was much more danger going down that road. They needed the state to work, uh, and they needed to work with the state. So this is why Morsi would give these sort of love letters to the security forces and the military and how wonderful everybody was. Um, when the state didn't care when the state, uh, the state apparatus didn't care that Morsi was basically doing their bidding and protecting them and breaking towards them, then Morsi uh, and I think his, his, his advisors, which were quite limited, uh, they, they sort of doubled down on the Brotherhood because the Brotherhood was really the only reliable reservoir of sort of being able to get things done. But then that allowed their opponents to tap into 30 years plus of discourse that Muslim Brotherhood people were only going to ever come in, ikhwanize the state, brotherhoodize the state. And so it was like a sort of like, we told you this was going to happen. Like, watch out. This is going to be like Iran or worse or whatever. And so I think that was the, the real problem is, uh, you know, Morsi was really in a structural position that was basically impossible. Uh, his job was to continue to demobilize the society, get them out of the streets, and allow the military to have this privileged position in the economy and possibly politically behind the scenes. And when Morsi was unable to do that because of the structural position he was in, not because of who Muhammad Morsi was, uh, then uh, when the mobilization didn't remove, then I think the military took the, the strategic idea. We were caught off guard with the last mobilization. It disrupted the state. If we're caught off guard again, it could wipe the state out. And so if we can't bring the revolutionaries into the formal structures through elections and whatnot, then let's take the counter-revolution to the streets. And that's what they did through the Tamarid movement and all these signatures and whatnot. Um, the last thing I want to say about this is that uh, the one thing I didn't mention while they weren't reforming the state and while they were going through all these election processes um, is the fact that um, you know, Khalid Saeed was beaten to death in Alexandria in June of 2010. Okay? And he became the sort of poster child of the revolution. And of course, it's you know, a terrible story. 
Uh, he, he, he has some sort of interaction with the police. It goes bad. They take him around a stairwell in a building, and they, they, they beat him to death. And the pictures were graphic, and you know his jaw is broken, and it's up by his ear. And, and Egyptians were so upset that the police could do this stuff with impunity and such daylight and such trans, you know, transparency that um, this one death really catalyzed a lot of people to come out and be against um, you know, police brutality and, and, and state violence against citizens. It was, it was not a red line. It's an overused term, but it was a sort of place where you weren't allowed to go. And um, if you look at the body count after Hosni Mubarak is removed from office, so you know, 850 people die in the 18 days against Mubarak. If you start looking at the body count afterwards, it's this sort of slow bloodletting that will sort of apex at the Rabah ad uh massacre, which, which Human Rights Watch says could be larger than Tiananmen Square in August of 2013. So accompanying these processes of elections and not reforming the state is also a process of massive violence from what remains of that state towards the society, and that is primarily military directed. And I think that what we're watching now is not a return to the bad old days of Mubarak or anything that looks like the Mubarak regime. The Mubarak regime was a much more elegant, inclusive regime. This is a much more mono-dimensional regime, and it has to use violence to help it engineer a polity. Um, so this is a regime in formation. This is something that's completely different than the Mubarak years, even though a lot of these people probably knew Mubarak. Um, and so I, I just am very sensitive to this whole authoritarian, democratic um, scale that political scientists like to bring out, where you slide up and down like you're on some sort of line. And I think that's dangerous, because if I'm right in how I analyze it and what I've seen, this is a completely new manifestation. And it's being run out of the office of military intelligence. CC himself is military intelligence. They've taken over the other intelligence branches that didn't used to belong to military intelligence. They now belong to military intelligence. All the economic projects that they're being done are being rerouted through the military's coffers. Right, so they're literally designing a state uh, like, okay, well, we've tried to do this with other players and tried to keep it, you know, and that didn't work, so fine. This is how we're going to design the state. But, you know, governance is still about goodies and distribution and economies growing, and they don't really have answers for that. So um, I, I don't, the, the most important thing I've learned is I was one of the people early on, like, trying to call it, like, is it a revolution or not? Is this democracy or not? And I've just got away from that thinking completely. Because what we're seeing is waves of, of mobilization versus waves of counter-revolution. And um, I, I tend to think that um, the Egyptian uprising of 2011 started a revolutionary process with, that had historical roots with lots of mobilization and protests, uh, and that this is not over by any stretch of the means. And I think that the next time whatever uh, group is in control or sitting on the seat whenever the um, next uprising happens, I think it'll be a lot less peaceful, and I think it's going to be a lot more militant from the crowds who now have these lovely experiences about how elections are used to, to kind of depoliticize you, how um, you know, Muslim Brotherhood people you know, stab you in the back to take over the state with this discourse, and how the military is something that, even though it's a national treasure, it also can't be trusted. So there, there's been a massive fragmentation of the state a massive fragmentation of governance and a massive fragmentation of sort of politics in Egypt. And that is a far more precarious position than what we thought were like the worst moment ever, these rigged elections in 2010. Um, those, were, those were sort of the good days. So, um, you know, uh, you're free to disagree, of course, um, but... Uh, Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Josh. <laughs> Um, before, before expanding the conversation to the other conference invitees, I want to give our four key speakers for this session an opportunity to weigh in on anything that has been sort of put forward up until now. Um, I have my own set of questions, but Shadi, um, Imad, Mona, and then back to Josh again. Are there any sort of you know, broader thematic issues you, you think need to be put on the table here to understand the role of the Muslim Brotherhood in the transition period that have not been discussed yet? Shadi? 
uh, and yeah. before you go, brief comments so that we can sort of yeah, be, get I'll everyone. For, yeah, thanks. yeah, just one uh, one very quick clarification first. So what, what Polity 4 measures is not whether Morsi himself was an autocrat, but whether Egypt under Morsi was more or less autocratic. I should have been maybe more precise about that. Um, so I, I just one one. Josh, I thought your your comments were actually really really good, and I, one thing I wanted to just um, to, to build on: Did the Muslim Brotherhood have agency? To what extent was the coup predetermined? And I think that you know, obviously, hindsight is twenty twenty. So now it seems that the Brotherhood did a lot of very dumb things, um, and you kind of look back and you wonder what the various inflection points were, where certain things could have maybe gone in a different direction. Where I do think the brotherhood, the brotherhood really matters here, is in understanding the fears the brotherhood provoked among a very influential part of the Egyptian population. And we can call them non-Islamists, anti-Islamist liberals, liberals with quotation marks, whatever it happens to be. But there were a group of people who saw the brotherhood as an existential threat to the very notion of the Egyptian state, of the identity of the Egyptian state. And that's where the religious component of what the Brotherhood represented becomes becomes very important. I actually remember I remember talking to um, talking to someone, I guess this was right after the the um, the first elections after Mubarak fell. And this was um, this was a secular a, a rather secular person who I knew quite well. And um, she was just distraught after the, the results came out because not just did the Brotherhood do well winning over 40%, but the ultra-conservative Salafis won 28% of the popular vote. So I saw her a couple days after and she was distraught and she was saying, I don't, I don't recognize my country anymore. This isn't the Egypt that I grew up with. And she felt so alienated from this emerging so democratic polity. She, and I think that kind of sense of alienation that better educated, somewhat liberal people felt is really important here because the Brotherhood represented some, a, a, different, a different country and a different, a different course and they felt they had to stop that. And that's where I think support for the coup becomes understandable that if you prioritize liberalism over democracy, a liberal could argue with some justification that uh, the military coup was necessary to prevent an outcome that would come in the future that would be unacceptable to liberals. Well, the relationship between liberalism and democracy is the next panel. Yeah. So we'll get to some of that there. But let me turn to, to Imad. Imad, you were in, in Cairo during this entire time. You were involved in these deliberations. One of the big sort of questions that emerges and it demands an explanation is why the Muslim Brotherhood seemed to be unable to really read uh, what was unfolding in society before them, not to anticipate the growing sort of fears that, you know, uh, Shadi was talking about in terms of the growing discontent, polarization, and to the make the appropriate adjustments. You know, the coup is coming around the corner. Everyone can see it, but they seem to be completely oblivious to the, the massive changes. How, how would you explain that? Okay. Uh, this is a very good question. Uh, but allow me just, you know, to comment on one thing and I'll address sure. the question immediately. Sure. I think about the perception of the Muslim Brotherhood, in addition to the idea that, you know, they were autocrats and anti-democratic and so on, I think there were two messages that the uh, Egyptian media and the, uh, the old state ma managed actually to send uh, to, to the general, one, one to the outside and one to the inside. The message to the outside, I agree fully with Muna that you know, it was, you know, this, this is a, a very autocratic, archaic regime that's calling for the re restoration of the caliphate. And that was you know, widely spread, and I think Sisi himself mentioned that more than once, and this is why you know, we had to move and stuff like that, which was not, not true. The second message, of course, was the inside. And uh, for, for, for a period at least of two years and a half, the, there was a systematic message that portrayed the, uh, or a strategy, a media strategy, that portrayed the Muslim Brotherhood, first of all, as non-Egyptians. It's a transnational movement, never cared about Egypt, uh, one of their general guides said, you know, Tuz of Masr, the hell with Egypt. They don't care about Egypt, and so on. The second message was that they were traitors, mm -hmm. meaning that they were selling the pyramids to Qatar. They were, <laughs> yes, yes. They were selling Sinai to uh, the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. 
they were selling halayb and two, two major southern cities in Egypt to the Sudan, halayb and Shalatin. They were selling the Suez Canal. They were selling everything. The third mes message, of course, was dehumanizing them. Uh, 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 they were always portrayed as sheep. That was the, 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 the term that was given to them, sheep, sheep, sheep. And if you are you know, like upset with a sheep, what do you do to, to it? You slaughter it. So there was a process. And actually, like a few months, uh, it, uh, actually it is starting November 2012, there was a systematic burning of their headquarters and so on, and, and, and even attack against their uh, 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 even houses and, and, and business and stuff like that. Now, um, the, the problem was, which they didn't realize this, that they were in power but not in control. The Muslim Brotherhood, yes, came to power through election, and they, they, they thought that they were, they eventually they would be able to, with time and gradually, they will take hold of the old state, which they failed miserably. Why? I agree with Josh, of course, the idea that, first of all, elections, they believed, you know, that they had, that the elections was a source of legitimacy, mm -hmm. and they were legitimate, and they played fairly and squarely, I mean, like, fair and square, and there is no need to be dislodged or anything. Even the, uh, the, the, the November disaster de de declaration and so on, it was rescinded in less than two weeks. Mm -hmm. He went back. Mm -hmm. And in more, many of these kind of what people considered as autocratic decisions, he went back on most of them. Um, so this is one thing. The other thing, of course, was the trust of the military. Uh, and, and this is a process that started immediately after the revolution. When you mean trust of the military, you mean the alliance that was sort of struck between the Muslim exactly. Brotherhood? Exactly. The, 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 yes, the, the, uh, the spectrum of alliance. Right. One of them, of course, one uh, a strong ally with the, with the military, starting from the SCAF days. This right. is not new. That's why I said we started from chapter two. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, like a, a whole process in which there was a lot of discussion, a lot of negotiation, a lot of lines drawn for them, a lot of threats of crushing, mm -hmm you know, bones and stuff like that. You know, there was, like, the, the, the lines were, were, were drawn on the, on, on, on the sand, as mm -hmm. they say. So this is one thing. In addition to a, a personal trust, to the fi final days, Morsi trusted Sisi a, a, a lot. Right. Really, he trusted him a lot. There is a story why he trusted him. I don't think I'm at liberty to say that. But Sisi, Sisi rendered a service to Morsi that enabled Morsi to get rid of Anan and Tantal. So Mursi start to trust him from that day. Right. I'll just give one story again. Sisi negotiated, um, uh, Mursi negotiated in April with uh, Ayman Noor to form a government. Ayman Noor put the condition that he would form the government with like appoint ministers with no interference. Mursi told him, except the defense minister, except Sisi. You keep Sisi. Because he really trusted him. And the second thing, actually it was Sisi who recommended the minister of interior, Muhammad Ibrahim, for Mursi. So this idea that you know, like a, a coup can really remove them right. was very remote. The, 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 finally, because I spoke a lot, it's the, um, this also undermining or underestimating, once again, the power of the street. Right. Because they thought, you know, and this was started early on between the two sources of legitimacy in Egypt. What was called, and I will translate, Sharayat al-Midan versus Sharayat al-Barlaman. Mm -hmm. The legitimacy of the street, the, the square itself, the revolution, versus the legitimacy of the parliament. And from day one, the Muslim Brotherhood settled this and they opted for the legitimacy of the parliament. The due process, the due process, the due process. Okay, great, thanks. Mona, do you want to comment on anything that's been said here or sort of amplify some of your earlier remarks? I mean, the, the, the real question here is, um, you know, trying to make sense of the Muslim Brotherhood's role and what were these sort of factors that explained, I think, their, um, their behavior. I mean, one of the questions that sort of is relevant to what we've been talking about here is, did they actually even have a strategy, a grand strategy, in the post-Mubarak period, or were they just making it up as it went along, sort of misreading every sort of decision and crisis that came along that just, you know, yeah. led to the coup? Yeah, in reflecting on this question, which I didn't um, get to elaborate at all, but let me just uh, piggyback on the comments that have already been made in trying to understand how the first elected presidency was so swiftly <laughs> and violently brought down. Um, here I part ways with Josh of it. I don't think that the role of the Muslim Brothers is a sideshow. Um, and I know you, you overemphasized the point just to make it clear. But 
in reflecting about what it is that they did to make them such easy targets for the deep state. I mean, it's a legitimate question. How is it that an organization that, yes, they had been out of power for 80 years, but they also happened to be the most organized political force in this country for 80 years. They had branches in every village. They, every family had a Muslim Brother member. Uh, they were very good in the politics of exchange, as Ellis uh, put it in one of his writings, that is, in giving people something in exchange for support. They were very good at that, and that should not be uh, simply uh, cast aside. So if we're trying to just clear the ground of all of the um, uh, epithets that were thrown mm -hmm. out at the brothers, if there's one thing that I would want to explore further is the way in which, and I also think it's easy to look back 2020 hindsight, hindsight yeah. it's, it's just, that's not an intellectually uh, valuable exercise. Mm -hmm. So I want to move away from that because it's so easy to just say, here's all the bad things that they did. And to be honest, I think most of the writing on the Muslim Brothers so far has been of that quality, mm -hmm. that they just look back on them and they literally give you a laundry list of here's all the things that this organization, so it leaves you as a reader not able to really understand, so, well, which one of these laundry um, items? So if you uh, were to ask me and if you um, push me against the wall to say what it is about them, I would say that the Muslim brothers were the perfect transitologists, by which I mean that they're, and here I want to piggyback on Ahmed's comment, their view towards popular mobilization throughout their career has always been deeply ambiguous and mistrustful. Like any conservative political party elite the world over, politicians in suits, parliamentarians, they are not comfortable with street protests that they don't control, and they never have been, and they're actually very open about that. So when the Egyptian revolution came along, far from hijacking it, they actually saw it as a political opening and an opportunity, quite opportunistically, because that's what political party elders do. They see this as an opening, and their thought was, much like the transitology literature, this is a wonderful uprising from below. It gives us a moment to actually enter into the precincts of Egyptian state power for the first time in 50 years. But uh, please go back to your houses now after you have queued up for us politely to vote for us. This is the essentially a very conservative view of politics, and it's shared by many scholars. The, the very famous volume, Transitions from Authoritarian Rule, if you read that volume, it literally shows the upsurge of civil society as this uh, sort of quirk event, it just happens. And then the populace goes back home and lets the political elites do their bidding. And that's very hazardous in a situation where you have an entrenched elite, uh, an insurrection, a popular insurrection, and a very weak counter elite that has no experience in power. So that's the factor that I would highlight. And I hope that it would also depart from lots of the polarization and the name calling towards the Muslim Brothers. I have no interest in attacking the Muslim Brothers, especially since, and if you'll allow me to just point this out, most of them, uh, if not all of them, are either in jail, killed, or in exile. And I think it's important to point that out. We don't have their version of the story. Morsi has not even been allowed, uh, literally, we haven't heard him because in his uh, court appearances, he's silenced uh, by a glass cage. And that's very significant. We haven't had any uh, understanding of whether they're undergoing revisions, whether they are writing mea culpas because they haven't had the chance. So I think that's very important in the public debate to point this out. It's very easy for us to sit back and say, here's all the bad things that they did. Um, morally, I don't think that's, uh, that's correct, but analytically, I also don't, uh, don't think it's, uh, it's okay. Great, thanks. Uh, Josh, do you want to sort of weigh in again on anything that's been said on this general sort of theme of the role of the Muslim Brotherhood? Right, so I spent most of my time talking about how nasty the military is and all the rest of the stuff, and, and that, um, I mean, I want to just kind of quickly go over what I thought about the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, so I, I lived in Egypt between 98 and 2007. And around, I, I first met the Muslim Brotherhood people in like 2000, and I kept doing research on them and, and ethnographically followed them for one of their elections and stuff. So I, I, I had a pretty large uh, bank of data to kind of mind and think about what I thought about the Muslim Brotherhood. And, and I guess... Um, you know, what, what I tended to find is, and I told them this once, like, well, the problem with you guys is you're not really sort of Islamist. You're more like a proper nationalist political party, which, of course, they, they rejected that. Of course, we're Islamists. So, you know, what are you talking about? You know, this is what we're going after. Um, and, and what I noticed is that, like, like, as Mona said, they're not interested in mobilization or that they don't control at all. 
If you go to their protests, they're very stationary. There's a guy on a stage. Like, you know, there's all sorts of ways that you look at a protest. Is it moving? Is there coordination with the audience? Like, and, and, and they're sort of that level one. Um, so they're not really comfortable with mobilization they don't control. And the other thing that really sort of damaged the Brotherhood um, is um, it was probably far more big tentish than we think about it, right? There were lots of different ideas there. And so this is why when Western journalists would roll through Cairo and they like, okay, I went down to the Brotherhood and I talked to some guy and he wants to cut somebody's head off. I see, I told you they're not being moderate. And, and the thing is, is, you know, we would never tolerate this kind of behavior in our own society. Like, well, I went to some Republican headquarters in this place, and they said this, therefore, all Republicans, right? So um, I think that because they were so big tent and because they probably had people in there that were far more um, conservative in their interpretations of the scriptures as well as sort of how they want to choose to worship, um, I think that, that this put a lot of pressure on the Muslim Brotherhood to actually not be more pragmatic during the transition because, because when the Salafis started doing well in elections and things, I think it forced them to kind of guard that flank um, because the Salafis were the ones that were really kind of hammering, you guys aren't Islamists enough, we're the real Islamists. And, and so I think that was uh, also a big problem for the Brotherhood. Uh, far too much control at the top, not real good at dealing with dissent from the bottom, but you know what, political parties everywhere all over the world, that's their dynamic. If a bunch of 28-year-old kids are telling you, like, use Twitter and Facebook more, you know, um, the leaders of the Democratic Party don't necessarily always take on all those suggestions, and that's not, we don't consider that weird. So I think we need to be more nuanced in how we understand what the Brotherhood is, and what it is is just a real live political party on like every stretch of the imagination with crazy people and not so crazy people and you know a middle center mainstream so I think that's that's my view of the brotherhood okay thanks Josh let's broaden the the circle of conversation here let's go to Ellis and then to Dan and then just general statements on the broad theme of the role of the Muslim Brotherhood in the in the transition period things that haven't been discussed and keep it to a few minutes so that we can get everyone included and then we'll go down to the end of the panel Ellis um, okay well let me let me just say a couple of things first I didn't spend a lot of time with uh, people in the uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, I'm a little surprised though, that nobody has mentioned the work of Hussam Tamam uh, who I think is an important, uh, late Hassan Tamam, uh, Egyptian scholar. I think it is important to recognize that the Muslim Brotherhood were internally quite authoritarian, uh, that most people recognize that, but also that they were, in the years before the revolution and certainly during the years of the revolution, themselves highly fractured. So as Mona points out, not only was the regime itself troubled uh, by the uprising, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood themselves were troubled, and there were profound splits within that organization, uh, which they were constantly and frantically, I think, trying to deal with. Uh, in addition, uh, it seems to me that they themselves were uncertain about their own, where they themselves stood. So on occasion, they would try to uh, limit the, political, the rights of their political opponents, to strip them of political rights. Uh, then they would retreat when the judges said, well, you can't do that. So their own uh, orientation toward what was going on was, I think, very contradictory, and I think that's probably a reflection of their own internal debates. Um, that's one, that's, so that's one thing. They also had their own connection to the judiciary. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood were quite closely connected to the so-called reformist uh, judiciary, who began to play, I think, an often unremarked-on role in the very first days of the revolution. Uh, I mean, I remember... Uh, since I was there also, uh, the degree to which the demand for a new constitution really comes in the first day or two of the uprising uh, in late January uh, from the leader of the judges club. The first thing, and the, the constitution has fallen because there's so many people in the streets. And then you ask yourself, well, does that mean that whenever there are that many people in the streets, a constitution falls? Because that's the narrative then that develops around June 30th. And that's the narrative that, in fact, the, some of the judges uh, and the Muslim Brotherhood themselves uh, were pursuing uh, at the beginning of the uprising. Um, I also think we tend to overestimate the degree to which the elections always indicated support for the Ikhwan as opposed to support for the army. 
So it's easy to read the first referendum on the constitutional amendments as a referendum of the Islamists against the liberals. But remember, the army was on the same side, and many people probably thought of themselves as voting to mm -hmm. empower or enable the army to push the events forward. Mm -hmm. uh, we've tended to read that in a different way, and I'm not sure that that was my recollection of the period on the streets is a little bit different. Um, lastly, uh, well, two things. So I think the Ikhwan do look like, to me, in some ways, like the Orthodox CPs, except they lack the, for whatever reasons, um, they lack the ability to have the kind of uh, revision of failed policies that the Orthodox CPs traditionally had. A party congress, a recognition that the old, the old leadership has failed, we have to get rid of them and install new policies. It's not that I think the Orthodox CPs, the French, the Italian, uh, or other CPs had real discussions, but at least they had some mechanism for enabling themselves to make their own transitions. Lastly, and here I want to just pick up on something that uh, I guess Mona and Josh have both said. Um, I think we're looking at uh, my own particular take on the events of the last three years. Um, especially, I mean, again, I remember going out for dinner with a friend on January 23rd, and we were, the, the silliest thing you could think of, the least likely possibility is someone's going to call a revolution and everybody will show up on January 25th. And uh, as so often in Egyptian history recently, the least likeliest thing seemed to be what actually happened. But I think if, if we're looking at a revolutionary fracturing of society and the state, then we're not looking at a democratic transition. We're looking at a very different kind of process. Uh, and if that's the kind of process that we're looking at, then we have to look much more to the politics rather than to what I think is often an attempt to do an external evaluation. Did Morsi, did, was it, was it, did Morsi really deserve a coup? Did the Muslim Brotherhood do something that justified a coup? Well, no. Okay, they didn't. But the problem is we're looking, from my point of view at any rate, at a situation of much more profound, raw, revolutionary politics. Uh, in which, as I think most revolutionary leaders would tell you, if you fail, you go to the wall. I mean, that's, I'm not saying I approve of that, but I think mm -hmm. that's what happens uh, in these kinds of situations. So we have t uh, adopted very often, certainly in my discipline, a peculiar optics of political science as opposed to politics. <laughs> and it seems to me that it's more important to recognize what the politics of the situation were, the degree to which the Muslim Brotherhood we're incapable, this is not a moral failing, but we're incapable of resolving the tremendous social conflicts, tensions, oppositions that were, that emerged really in the last three years. Uh, and for that reason, their ability to hold on to power to manage this transition or revolution uh, failed. But in fact, and here I'll just conclude, that's often what happens in revolutions. Mm -hmm. The people who make the revolution, whether it's France, Russia, China, don't always remain, very rarely remain on top. And lastly, the important work of the revolution is usually done in the first six months. And I think that's true here. We can talk later about what that would be. Okay, thanks, Alice. Uh, Dan? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, uh, I, I'm intrigued by Ellis's remarks about the Communist Party. I was, I was raised by a, a, a leader of the Bundes Socialist Party from Poland, and I... Yeah, went to summer camp in the Catskills and had to shout uh, socialist slogans at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, this didn't seem like the summer camp that I had imagined. But, but um, one of the things that the, the Bund did was they were constantly engaged in a kind of self-criticism and discussion of where they were going and how they were evolving, whereas m m the kinds of parties we were talking about in terms of the Ikhwan and the, <coughs> the Communist Party, uh, you know, th they allow for a certain amount of dissent, but that kind of ethos is... The ethos of control is the one that prevails. Um, and uh, many of us have talked to, talked to the young members of the Muslim Brotherhood who had been kicked out of the uh, movement because they simply weren't allowed to, to speak up and have, uh, and have their voice heard. But I do want to say something in re reference to Shadi's presentation, not to go over the presentation in a political science-y kind of way for that purpose, but only because I think there are some things in his paper that speak to some fundamental questions about this conference and how we understand what happened to the Muslim Brotherhood. And to, the, and to the revolution itself. And for, for, for persons of full disclosure, Shadi was my, uh, my student at Georgetown University. And I have a lot of gray hair that's finally appearing here. So, um, and, but, I, uh, uh, but I'm going to disagree with him, not because I want to berate him in any, in a, in, for, for that purpose, but only because I think there's some issues that are raised in this paper that are fundamental to our discussion. I, I think, and 
here I will agree with Josh, I don't think the issue is whether the Muslim Brethren was autocratic or not, because during periods of transition, um, transitions are not by themselves democratic. In order to have democratic outcomes, a lot of things have to, ha have to happen, some of which are very much not democratic. And one of the goals in a successful transition, if it's possible, is to create political consensus, particularly when you're within the opposition, particularly when you're facing an organization such as the Egyptian military. I fully agree with Josh. This was overdetermined. You had a military that was determined to keep power in many respects. Uh, you had, I think, the non-reformist judiciary was very, was very was a very key player in in this in this in this partnership of making sure that they could. Uh, uh, can contain the threat posed by uh, the opposition, by the Muslim Brother in particular. Um, and structurally speaking, I do think that the Muslim Brother faced an almost uh, imp uh, impossible situation. But this is what oppositions face. And we cannot uh, take the agency away of considering the kinds of decisions were made and the mistakes that were made, because there may be eventually round two, and there should be some sort of learning process. And therefore, I don't think it does anybody any good to uh, ignore what I think were some pretty important mistakes. Perhaps they weren't catastrophic, Josh, but they were pretty important. Um, and here, as like, to get back to my point here, the issue is not whether uh, you, you, they were acting democratically. In fact, in many respects, you could make the argument that, was, that, that uh, Morsi uh, it was acting democratically, was following the rules, and that was maybe in some sense, from some, per, from some perspectives, part of the problem. Uh, because they were not really interested in creating a genuine consensus with other members of the opposition, perhaps many members of the opposition, including on the left and the revolutionary, who didn't want to have a consensus with the Muslim Brethren. But there was very little effort, I think, to reach out and, and create the kind of uh, unified uh, uh, opposition that could have had some, maybe, maybe not. Well, you know, it may have been, as I said before, overdetermined. But there wasn't a real effort, I think, to reach out and create the kind of consensus. And that process is not necessarily itself democratic. So I think that if you ask the wrong kinds of questions, all the data in the world won't get you the right answers. And I think this is, this is where I disagree with the, with the paper, because I think it's asking the wrong questions. And I fundamentally uh, think we have to ask, ask the right questions. And here, in a process of uh, transition, if we compare Egypt to Tunisia, a place that I've been spending a lot of time for the last year and a half, you have a markedly different dynamic in which the issue of consensus has been the one that has really driven this process. And the creation of consensus in that case has been a process that often is not democratic. Um, but it, it is the one that creates the kinds of, uh, uh, of shared uh, uh, rulemaking that you need to have a, a transition. Now, to, and I'll end here, to reiterate my point, it may have been that and whatever the Brethren did, whatever uh, the readiness to draw a more fundamental consensus with the, within the opposition, as opposed to alienate them, scare them, frighten them, is, which is what happened uh, consistently, um, it would not have made a difference. But we'll never know, because I don't think that effort was really made. With time quickly fleeting, I want to see if there's an opportunity to get the audience involved. But um, as it was announced earlier in terms of the format, um, if there's anyone who wants to weigh in, just raise their hand. I, I, Joel, and then I don't know if there's anyone on the right, Mohammed, and then um, and then Abdullah, and then we will see if we have any time left for questions. Joel. Yeah, thanks. I'll be uh, I'll be brief. My notes keep changing as new speakers get added to all of this. Um, so I think I want to say quickly in response to, to sort of Dan and Josh's comments, which we which we all I mean agree with in many ways. But Shadi's starting with this question that, as as I think Mona says, we have to ask because of the way the argument has been couched, um, and even I, I would say to a fault starts by suggesting that we ask this question by prefacing it with this notion that Mohammed Morsi was a bad president, et cetera, et cetera. And I find so often we have to start with this kind of defensiveness about this, um, and and I wish we didn't. It's a uh, it's an interesting period, but I have three quick questions to throw back at people who may know the current brotherhood and situation more than I do. I know the old brotherhood uh, a bit more. Um, can you be both a conservative force that's deeply committed to state structures, albeit wanting to reform them and perhaps Islamize them, and be revolutionary at the same time? Um, We've always talked about the Brotherhood, particularly as the Islamist movement radicalized at various moments, let's leave it to Egypt in the 70s and then into the 80s, as being a very conservative force uh, and one that didn't ever want to bring the house down. Uh, so now they have this moment. 
And I think we need to wonder, particularly with this discourse that's bothered me for the last few years about you know, who made the revolution and who the revolutionaries really are. Can the Muslim Brothers be part of that? And I think the moment that I want to ask about briefly, and perhaps people who were there can tell me, is that yes, the Brotherhood is a very controlling organization, et cetera, et cetera. But what about that one moment when they didn't have control? What about when they decided to go down into Tahrir Square and hijack whatever, but let's just say join the revolution. And that was not a situation in which they could control. So what's their position there? What's their role there in terms of pushing the situation forward? Secondly, uh, this is partly in response to Josh's comments about the old Mubarak regime. Uh, years ago, I don't know, 15 plus years ago, I wrote an essay called When Were the Good Old Days? Uh, and I think I was talking about the 40s and 50s and 60s and changing perceptions. But it seems to be a paper that could be written and written and written and rewritten. Um, and despite this wonderful song that was out there when I wrote it by, I think, Shadia, she sang, Bukra Ahlam in the Harda, uh, tomorrow will be sweeter than today. Uh, most Egyptians, I think, always think that uh, the good old days were yesterday. Um, and I think we may, we may be looking at that. But I want to look back and have us look back at this stalled year because it's an interesting period. And for all that didn't happen, um, maybe those will turn out to be the sweetest days in some respects. Uh, I think it's an interesting period where there was a lot of potential. And yes, it got sidetracked. Um, lastly, I want to take this back to Morsi himself, um, although many of us oftentimes uh, caution against personalizing regimes, Saddam Hussein, Bashar al-Assad, even Hosni Mubarak. Uh, but we did have Mohamed Morsi as president of Egypt, and of course he was an accidental president. Um, they called him the spare tire, uh, because the people who probably should have been president were legislated out, and there's this tricky question about should the Brotherhood officially align or not with the Freedom and Justice Party. Um, I'm wondering, and I'd, I'd love to know people's opinions, I'd really love to know opinions from within the Brotherhood itself, which we, we may not know, as to whether or not there was regret or rethinking or what the attitude is on Morsi's selection as this person to become the president. Um, Non-charismatic, of course, Egypt hadn't had a charismatic president since 1981, and I guess they got used to it. Um, but would someone else in the Brotherhood have perhaps been able to do something more differently uh, or led the country in a different way? And the other thing that I'm always thinking about, because we had this election in which many people who didn't support the Brotherhood were caught between voting for a Brotherhood leader and for a member of the old regime, um, was he perhaps the safe kind of candidate which allowed people to go out and vote for him? And would a more charismatic, fiery... Um, a different kind of brotherhood leader have scared away some people who voted for him and given us back Ahmed Shafiq and the old regime immediately. Uh, these are kinds of questions that I want to throw out. Okay. Thanks. Um, Mohammed and then Abdullah. Just a quick question to Shadi. Um, I totally take your argument about the uh, pretextual nature of the autocracy given what's going on in Egypt and the fanatic support uh, that Sisi has among his core. But what I don't quite get is the illiberal argument, because it's not as though we have a liberal autocracy. We certainly have a very socially conservative autocracy, in many ways much more repressive than anything happened, I mean, in terms of personal freedoms, uh, than was the case when Morsi was a year, was year in power. So I don't, I don't find that narrative very compelling, if only because there aren't, I, I don't see social liberals in Egypt, right? Who are they? I mean, you, would, it, you think that you would, you would sound like this narrative, like you have Manhattanites living in Masul Gedida and Maadi compared to people in Georgia, right? But that's not the case. By American standards, they're all extremely socially conservative. So I don't see the rub. Shadi, do you want to respond to that before I go to Abdullah? Yeah, yeah, sure. Because well, it's an interesting Yeah, it response. is interesting, yeah. So I, there are certainly people who are l less illiberal than the Brotherhood is. So I, I kind of see it as a continuum. The Brotherhood is in a particular place on that spectrum, and there are many people who are uncomfortable with the Brotherhood's notion of interpretations of Islamic law, of how they want to Islamize society more, whatever that means. There, I mean, so yes, they are conservative. Liberals in Egypt are conservative compared to liberals in the US. 
Yes, that too, perhaps. But I mean, they, they were, so they were legitimately afraid of the Brotherhood. We might say, well, CC is also really socially conservative, so what are you really getting out of this authoritarian compact? But they believe, and for, for a variety of reasons, that CC is, CC is a, a different kind of social conservative than the Brotherhood, and maybe they might be able to influence the regime in positive ways. I think they're being proven wrong, but at the time, there was that expectation. So, I, you know, I take your point that they may have miscalculated, but at the time, there was optimism that CC would kind of promote a kind of somewhat tolerant, inclusive, even democracy. People actually maybe they were deceiving themselves, but that CC would restore democracy in some way. Mm-hmm. Abdullah? Yeah, the only thing I would add is, I mean, I think that these uh, critiques are quite often cr- contradictory. The, there's a problem with having this kind of autocratic democratic continuum or binary specifically because most of the critiques of the Muslim Brotherhood on the other side tend to be that they weren't revolutionary enough, mm-hmm. right? And so not being revolutionary is not the same thing as being democratic. And in fact, revolutionary measures quite often are actually quite undemocratic. And that was one of the biggest critiques of them uh, throughout Morsi's tenure and before. Um, so I don't think, especially when we're just examining the role of the Muslim Brotherhood, that it's useful necessarily to look at how democratic they were in a context that was clearly not necessarily conducive, especially given the, this notion of trying to fulfill the demands of the revolution. And just to kind of give um, a couple of quick examples, I mean, for instance, we look at when uh, Morsi attempted to remove the, the public prosecutor from office and try to appoint one. I mean, that was obviously not a very democratic move, but at the same time, it was clearly a demand of the revolution. But because it was the Muslim Brotherhood that did it, because it was Morsi, and because there was clearly a lot of uh, criticisms of him, that he was, even as he was trying to fulfill a demand of the revolutionaries, of course, that was met with, with severe uh, backlash and criticism. Um, but I think one of the most important turning points, and this has only been briefly mentioned, I think, just the, the role of the judiciary, I think Dan mentioned it, um, is really critical here, because I think that this belief in this institution specifically, not necessarily even just the military, um, is what really kind of led the Muslim Brotherhood specifically down uh, the path that they were in, is by abiding by rulings of a judiciary. And we can sit and hopefully in the next panel, maybe we can discuss more uh, in depth the role of the Egyptian judiciary, because I know there's a lot of questions about it. How independent is it? That's the, the question people keep uh, coming back to. But specifically, when we look at, for instance, the ruling uh, in June of 2012, and remember, this is right at the same time as the presidential elections are happening, and the uh, the courts essentially decide to disband the parliament, mm-hmm. the, the freely first freely elected parliament uh, in modern Egyptian history, and yet it's being disbanded, and that, that ruling is never really challenged in a revolutionary kind of way, mm-hmm. right? There's, of course, protests by the Muslim Brotherhood, but all of a sudden now you have no parliament and you have a president who's elected without a parliament, and more or less end up abiding by that decision. Um, now, to their credit, I think you know the Muslim Brotherhood tried to put up a little bit of an opposition, but certainly did not... Um, it, we didn't see any real outcry from any other forces within Egyptian society. And so for all this talk of democracy and for people who were supposedly... Uh, you know, really concerned about this transition to democracy as opposed to autocracy, where was really the outcry that the courts, and remember, these are the same judges who had been for decades authenticating the most fraudulent um, elections in Egyptian history, and yet here they are, they have the nerve on a technicality to try to disband uh, this this parliament. And so where is really the credibility that they even maintain in terms of being able to actually, um, you know, disband one of the, the, the critical transitional institutions, potentially. Of course, mm-hmm. we never got to see uh, where that parliament would have gone and what they would have done. But I think that at least is just an important measure in terms of the Brotherhood not being revolutionary enough as opposed to being autocratic versus democratic. Dan, do you want yeah, to? I just kind of uh, one, or, okay, one or two figures. I never remember these signals. Uh, what's the answer? What do you think the answer to your question is? It's an interesting question. And, and why wasn't there an outcry? I mean, how would you? I think because the, the Brotherhood is not a revolutionary movement at its core. I mean, I think the Muslim Brotherhood clearly demonstrated very early on that they're not interested in revolutionary politics, that they wanted to immediately move into a transition that was being uh, dictated specifically by the military, by the SCAF, and uh, was, was very measured and cautious in its approach to revolutionary politics. And, and I, think, I, mean, I think most people here have already kind of alluded to that at, at some point. Um, but that was the reason, essentially. And I think that they also put their, all their eggs in the presidential basket at one point as well. I think when the push was made to, uh, to promote a presidential candidate, they believed that they could accomplish a lot through the presidency that perhaps the parliament hadn't been able to, to do. Right. Okay, um, we have a few minutes left. Let's maybe take two questions from the floor back to back. One, is there another question? 
one question, and then um, if it's directed to any of the panelists or if it's for everyone, just state that at the beginning, and we'll try and get it answered. The question is, is for anyone. Um, I'm a Latin Americanist, and the discussion today uh, did not remind me of the transitions. It reminded me of our friends in Guatemala and reminded me of the end in Chile, mm -hmm. and how they came to power and how they fell. And I could also sort of come up with a whole list of things that they did wrong and that, you know, how they misread their political circumstances. But at the end of the day, I would be hard pressed to say if we had done this right, we would have stayed. Mm -hmm. so, so, what I would like to know is how the panel interprets this set of possible outcomes. What's, what's possible in this, in this international context in particular? Right. What could have happened, and it could be three flavors that watch what could we have recently. Yeah, Ellis and I were talking about this last night about the Latin American, you know, comparison. So it, it's a question is for everyone here um, if, on the panel. If you want to weigh in on that particular, Ellis, do you want to start? I, well, I'm not sure there's much that Allende could have done, because it, unlike Morsi, he had a, a, a parliament that was stacked against him. He had a Supreme Court that was calling for a coup because they said. On the other hand, it seems to me that in Brazil, if uh, Kubitschek hadn't resigned. Uh, to, with Quadros becoming the president, I, it's not clear to me that there would have been a coup. And by the way, if there hadn't been a coup in Brazil, it's not clear to me. The, the Brazilian military was kind of played the role of the Egyptian military uh, regionally. So it's not clear to me what would have happened uh, in terms of the alliance between the uh, Argentinian, the Chilean, and the uh, Brazilian military had there not been a coup. Uh, by the same token, the, the other thing that I think is true, I think Egypt looks a lot more like Brazil than it looks like Chile. Um, but what I think is different, especially about Brazil, and I think this was actually, there are several things that I think were very important that could have happened in Egypt, including the, region, the election of governors. There's been a widespread rejection in the Egyptian polity of what are called um, kind of um, localist demands. So there's a very centralized, very powerful state. In Brazil, it seems to me what's very important in terms of the the resistance both to the military uh, forces but also to the reconstruction of democracy is the role of the governors, uh, the, local, the elections within the, the provincial elections or uh, governor elections. So the historic division between, um, uh, well, Rio and also uh, Sao Paulo uh, as opposed to the central government uh, and then the Nordeste, is, those are very important uh, aspects, I think. Uh, of Brazilian politics. And it's not that they, they wouldn't be duplicated in Egypt. Uh, you can certainly see them in terms of the strength of the Salafi movement in the south. But as Mona pointed out, what you don't get is the emergence of uh, people with significant governing experience, which is really very important in Brazil, uh, who also have regional, severe, so significant and secure regional power bases. And if that were that to be the case, and that was clearly something that nobody was very interested in, in pressing, um, I think Egyptian politics would begin to look very different. Just over time, if there's, does anyone else on the panel want to comment on the question? Shadi, go ahead. So I think there were a couple points where things could have turned out differently. Um, keep in mind the internal Shura Council vote in the Brotherhood about running a presidential candidate was a very close vote. If I recall, it was it was only by uh, one or two votes in the end. And there was a lobbying effort by Khairat al-Shatr's allies to push certain undecided Muslim Brotherhood leaders to vote for running a presidential candidate. If that lobbying effort didn't happen, let's say, hypothetically, the vote could have swung in the other direction. I mean, that's one example. There was an EU mediation. It would have went in the other direction, and then the Muslim Brotherhoods would not have, would not have run a presidential, a presidential candidate. candidate, and that could have made a huge difference. Yeah, and I mean, there was an EU mediation um, up until in, in April that came very close to forging a kind of compact between, a temporary one, between the Brotherhood and the so-called liberal opposition of the National Salvation Front. And we don't know exactly why those discussions failed. There are different claims on both sides. But that was a very serious mediation process. Let's also ask hypothetically, what if the US early on had put more pressure on the military from even before Morsi was elected? I mean, there was a sense that the military could get, get away with pretty much anything, with murder, with coups because the U.S. wasn't willing to use its leverage. What if it was? 
what if Morsi had resigned preemptively and then the presidency would have passed on to the head of the Shura Council who was also a Muslim Brotherhood member? The Brotherhood could have taken the initiative and forced the military to respond. What would the military have done if the head of the Shura Council was the new president and early elections were scheduled for two or three months from that point where the Brotherhood still probably would have, still would have had a chance to win? Great, okay. Um, um, we're running about, uh, let me see, five minutes behind, no, three minutes behind schedule. So let's stop there, take a break. Let me thank the panelists, particularly the four, for their interventions and comments. And we'll start again um, at approximately 11.15. So if everyone could be back in their seats at 11.15 for the second session, coffee's at the back. Thanks.